Okay, at this time, we have the pleasure of hearing our first message, which will be brought to us by Mr. Ken Barton. It is entitled, What is Your Concept of God? And the key verse is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 14 through 18. So how is everybody today? Good. You know, I have made it to the hallowed halls of old. If you have a choice to just, you know, stay in the young, go with it. But it's better than the alternative. But, you know, young folks these days, they have... So many things, and I, and I use I use this puppy a lot. But there's a lot of things that I don't understand. You know, Bitcoin, forget that. That's just... But one of the things I want you guys to remember, if any young ones start razzing you, just tell them I can't Snapchat, I can't TikTok, I can write in cursive, I can do math without a calculator, and I can tell time on a clock with hands. <laughs> right? <clears throat> so what is your concept of God? Is, is the way I titled this, and underneath that I, as an afterthought to me, is are we insulting him? I've been reading a book entitled Knowledge of the Holy, by Aidan Wilson Tozer, or A.W. Tozer, and I found it uh, on my e-sword. Uh, and he's it's, it's an interesting man. He, he lived from uh, April 21st, 1897 to May 12th, 1963. And according to his website, awtozer.com, if you want to go look at it, he was a self-taught theologian, a fearless preacher, and considered by many to be a modern-day prophet. One day when he was walking home from work, he heard a street preacher say, if you don't know how to be saved, just call on God. Taking that to heart, he went home, climbed up in the attic, and did just that. And it would seem that from that point on, he strove to grow closer to God. Focused on three th things, prayer, study, and proclamation. He would sometimes arrive at his office in the early morning and pray for up to three hours at a time. He also did a lot of studying, reading extensively the works of many authors, including uh, early church fathers, uh, mystics, writers from the Middle Ages, reformers, Puritans, philosophers, and even his contemporaries. This after having ended his formal education at the third grade, I'm sorry, sixth grade. On his tombstone is this epitaph, A.W. Tozer, a man of God. In the preface of this book, Knowledge of the Holy, Mr. Tozer says that, a messenger of Christ, though he speaks from God, must also, as the Quakers used to say, speak to the condition of his hearers. If he doesn't, then he will really be speaking a language known only to himself. It's not going to do a lot of good, is it? The speaker, he states, must speak to those of his own generation, to those around him. He then states an opinion that is central to this book, that the modern church has a lousy concept of God, that continues to get worse. That we have and are continuing to lose the concept of the majesty of God. I'm inclined to agree with that point. In fact, I see a close relation to the level of our belief in God and the state of our nation, in fact, our world, at this point. You see, it occurs to me that it is arguable that the more we lose our level of faith in our Lord God, the more that we lose his protection of us. Not by any stretch of the imagination due to God losing power, but because our sinful lives diminish our abilities to communicate with him. God is holy. God is absolutely 
totally holy, and he cannot countenance or abide sin. The more sinful we become, the less we are inclined to go to him, right? Scripture is talking about loving the darkness more than the light. Going to him is the only way that we can be in a right relationship with him and thereby avoid the consequences of our act, that our actions bring about. It brings to mind an observation that President Ronald Reagan made in his inaugural address on January 5, 1967. He said, perhaps you and I have lived too long with this miracle to properly be appreciative. Freedom is a fragile thing. And it's never more than one generation away from extinction. It's not ours by way of inheritance. It must be fought for and defended constantly by each generation. For it comes only once to a people. And those in world history who have known freedom and then lost it have never known it again. Government is the people's business. And every man, woman, and child becomes a shareholder with the first penny of tax paid. With all the profound wording of our federal constitution, probably the most meaningful words are the first three, we the people. And those of us here today who have been elected to constitutional office and to the legislature are in that three word phrase. We are of the people. We are chosen by the people to see that no permanent structure of government ever encroaches on the people's freedom or assumes a power beyond that which has freely been granted to us by the people. And he's talking to the politicians up there, right? <clears throat> we stand between the taxpayer and the tax spender. So they were there they were gathered there to inaugurate the new president. Why are we here? Here. What is our purpose of our coming together every Sabbath and on God's holy day? And why do you think God requires it and still does? To help us to maintain a right relationship with one another and most importantly with him because God truly desires that with us but it absolutely must be a right relationship. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 7, 13 through 18. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then... I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. That was the temple. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. As for you, talking to Solomon, if you walk before me as your father David walked and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I covenanted with David your father, saying you shall not fail to have a man as your ruler in Israel. That's the instruction God gave to Solomon. This is the guy that God said, I will make you the wisest. I wish he'd have been able to follow all that. Anyway, then Moses also gave these instructions to the Israelites to keep them, to try to keep them on track. Deuteronomy, starting in uh, chapter 17, 14 through 20. <clears throat> when you come to the Lord, which the Come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. 
He knew it already, didn't he? God knew what was coming. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother, but he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to do to you, you shall not return that way again. You did that once, been there, done that, gave the t-shirt away. Don't go back. Anyway, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law and a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And that shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So what does it mean by this law? That's the Torah. In, in Judaism, the law of God, as revealed to Moses and recorded in the first five books of scriptures, the Pentateuch. So that means all five books in Judaism, I've found, uh, means teaching, instruction, and law. It'll cover all of them. That's a pretty good idea, I think, for the person in charge of a nation, in any nation, to write down his own copy of God's instructions on how to live. Wouldn't that be nice? Don't you think it'd be great if we could get our rulers to actually do that? <clears throat> we will, but it'll be God himself, the author, and Jesus. If you personally, let's see, if you personally copy something by hand, and the rest of you guys can use this hand, that's okay. Uh, then you'll have a pretty good memory of it, won't you? You kind of have an idea of what's there. But let's go back to our concept of God. Where would a person get that from? Where do we get our concept of God from? I remember my father telling me about how he came to understand about observing the Sabbath. And he did it kind of, sort of. He never went to any Sabbath churches, but I'm sure God's going to talk with him about that. But it was from reading the Bible and paying attention to what he read while he was in the hospital. He was in the hospital for several months, and you run out of things to do, and he got to thinking and said, you know, there's a lot of things that people have told me through my life that's in the Bible. So he started reading the Bible to check those things out. <clears throat> he wanted to be able to nail things down and was quite surprised when he found that a lot of the things weren't there. Sunday worship wasn't there. Anyway, but that's how a lot of us learn about the world and everything is what other people say. There was a guy that I worked with on the fire department. He thought salt and pepper was used to cool down food. Because every time they'd sit down to eat dinner, his dad would take a bite and go, whoa, that's hot, and he'd grab the salt and pepper, put that on there. So he just reasoned it out. That must be what those do. Forget the fact that it gives him a little bit of time to do something instead of going, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> but that's how we get a lot of our clues by observation. It's how we learn how certain people uh, are treated, how elders are treated. We're supposed to. You know, uh, I see things every so often uh, on Facebook that said, yeah, I was, I was uh, reared. I wasn't just allowed to grow up. 
I open doors for people that are older than me, especially for ladies, and I say, thank you. And I say, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. <clears throat> God knows that if we'll keep his statutes and judgments in our minds and hearts, we'll be far less likely to go astray. Because if we know them, we know what God is like. That reading God's word is where we can get a real good concept of God, isn't it? <clears throat> That's probably why he gave us that manual, basic instructions before living eternally. B-I-B-L-E. I'm not going to sing that song. Anyway, so, you know, Genesis 1-1 through five, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Pretty good start for a concept here, isn't it? Then he goes into detail. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the earth, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, saw that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. How powerful is that? God just says what he wants to happen, and it happens. That's power. Here's a visual concerning the power of God that I came across a while back. <clears throat> this is Mount Sinai. Okay? From here up, it's black. And even if you get up there, and, and I've, I've seen closer photographs of the stones and stuff, they are charred black, like they'd been in a fire or something. That's where God came down, and it's still there today. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I come to you in the thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak to you. This is starting at Exodus 19.9. And then, then starting at 16, excuse me, through 20. Then it came to pass on the third day, in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. Causing that. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. Its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him by voice. Then the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai, on top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. That's power. Jesus twice reiterates that we can partake of God's power through just a little bit of faith. Did you know that? Luke 17, 6. So the Lord said, if you have the faith as a mustard seed, I should have brought one, but I can't think much further than this. Anyway. If you have the faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and planted, be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. The other time he says this, he's answering a question from his disciples. It's Matthew 17, 19, and 20. And then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why couldn't we cast it out, the demon? <clears throat> Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. 
Now, what do you think most people who are outside of the church would say about this? Most these days would say that that's just an idiom. This just didn't really happen. Just story. These, of course, are the same people who don't believe Jesus spoke to a live fig tree condemning it and it being withered and dead when they passed by later that same day. My point here is that we must believe that God is holy and all-powerful, or we may as well not bother. Because if you do not believe God, do not have faith in God, you won't experience God's power. I've been healed twice through anointing and prayer. First time when I was a young boy, and second time in October when I was in the hospital. So James 5, 13 through 15. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing songs. Let people know what kind of world you're in. You know, praise God out loud every once in a while. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. Or her. It works both ways. Anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Faith, huh? Hmm. Where do we learn about that from? Learn about it from God. But we also learn about it from people we know that use it and, and, and exercise it. I had an aunt, and she was actually a great aunt, great uncle. Uh, he and my grandfather founded a church at Pine Place in Norfolk, and Tulsa is still there. They've been gone a long time. Uh, he had a he was a bricklayer, fell off a third-story scaffold, broke his back. I think it was three months, but I'm not sure. He was, had, had a crutch on each armpit and was back to laying brick. But he went to the union board and he told them, he said, you, this was the before he was able to go back to work, he said, it looks like I'm not going to be able to go to work. So rather than just piddle off the money that I have in my account, I found a house. Give me my money and I'll buy the house and you guys won't have to worry about taking care of me. And it was on North Columbia, about a block and a half south of Apache. And uh, this is a, fair size lot, he had two uh, gardens on it. One was his garden and one was God's garden. And he took care of both of them pretty much the same. And he said he was never able to grow more in his garden than what grew in God's garden always grew more. And he never worried about it. You know, they, they when you're the pastor of the church, you bring folks home with you, right? So they were always bringing folks home, and they never were lacking. And one day, my cousin was staying with her grandma, and she went ran to the went to the mailbox when the postman went by, and says, "Grandma, you got a letter." And so she looked, opened it up, and there was a check. And she goes, "Oh, I was wondering where that was." And she said, "What do you mean?" She said, "My washer." washing machine quit and I was waiting for it this will pay for it she lived it so if you learn about faith from the world from Satan and people that aren't God's children you'll be sorely misled but here's a hint there is no Santa there is no other God from Jehovah God I believe God I believe God's words. 
I believe God's word, Jesus, and I believe God's words, Scripture. I believe Jesus, and I believe Jesus' words. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things are made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. So they were both, right? Both working together. Jesus spoke of himself in John three thirteen through 17. No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven. That is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Some people have a concept of God, especially in the Old Testament, like he was a different God, that he was mean and hateful and just loved to kill people and trying to get their attention, trying to show them this is not a fairy tale. This is not fun time. This is, I am God. You need to know that. Peter witnessed of Jesus to the Gentiles in Acts 10, 34 through 43. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation who fear, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism of John, which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sin. There's a saying, before you can get them saved, you've got to get them lost. That's a, kind of more of a Baptist thing, but it's still true. People have to realize their situation before they realize they need help. So here's the thing. Why do we come here to learn about our Lord, the Lord God, Jesus, the Messiah, which means the anointed one in Hebrew and in Greek, it's two different words, the Christ in Greek, Messiah in Hebrew, and it means the same thing, the anointed one. <clears throat> what our responsibilities are, because we are the children of God, and we have given a, been given a task to do. We are to share God's promise, because it is of great importance. <clears throat> we have his spirit, John 14, 16, and 17. I will pray the Father that he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Then 1 John 4, 8 through 11 he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. 
In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And then jumping down to 14, 15 and 16, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. So here's my answer to the question. My concept of God is that he is the only omnipotent, loving, and holy God, creator of all that is. In him there is no evil, and through him all that exists has its being. I believe that his promises are absolutely true and will come to pass. What is your concept of God?